Okay, thank you, Larry. Um, I'm going to call to order uh, this special meeting of the Capitola City Council. Um, and can we uh, start with a roll call, please, Chloe? Council Member Bertrand. In attendance. Council Member Brooks. Here. Council Member Brown. Here. And Mayor Story. I'm here. And I'm going to ask uh, Council Member Bertrand if you'd uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and liberty for all. I always want to say okay. amen. Drives me crazy. Thank you. Uh, that was the fast version. Well done. Um, so um, let's now move on to item number two, additions, deletions to the agenda. We have no changes proposed to the agenda this evening. Uh, any additional materials? No, none were received. Uh, Chloe, I should maybe um, take a pause to let you make an announcement. Okay, thank you. In accordance with California Senate Bill 361, this meeting is not physically open to the public. Council and staff are meeting via Zoom, and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting using Zoom or a landline or mobile phone, along with how to submit public comment during the meeting tonight, is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, and on the published meeting agenda. The public can also live stream the meeting on our city website or on our YouTube channel. As always, the meeting is also being cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Our technician this evening is Olivia. Thank you, Olivia, and thank you, Mayor Story. Thank you, Chloe, and uh, also thank you, Olivia, uh, for being our technician this evening. Uh, so that brings us to oral communication. This is um, opportunities for members of the public to address the council um, on uh, items on the consent agenda, which uh, there are none this evening. Um, Mayor Story, you muted yourself. Thank you. I'll repeat myself. Um, and um, uh, I was saying this is an um, opportunity for um, uh, oral communication with members of the public who would like to address the council on items that are not on tonight's agenda. And um, I'll ask um, Larry, do we have any attendees? I don't see any. Um, no, at this point, we do not have any attendees to the meeting and we have not received an email. Okay. Uh, just in the event, also, if those who may be listening in on, on um, the phone number, um, strike that. Well, yeah, you can dial star nine if you, if you want to. Um, uh, communicate with the council, or if you want to send an email, you can do so at public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. And um, still appears to be no attendee, so we'll see if anything should come through. Next, we'll move on to staff. Um, and city council comments. Are there any staff comments? I don't believe we have any comments for you this evening. Um, council members, any comments? Seeing none, I'll um, move on to the uh, business at hand this evening, which is the presentation of the proposed fiscal year 2022-23 budget for the city of Capitola and the Capitola Successor Agency. The recommended action is acting as the City Council and the Successor Agency to receive the proposed budget, provide staff direction, 
and continue budget deliberations for the next joint budget hearing scheduled on May 19, 2022. Um, and I'll ask for a staff report, but before you begin the staff report, I just thought maybe in order to kind of break this up a bit, um, um, we could, um, I'm gonna ask maybe after the revenue section, uh, whether you know, just seeing if there's any um, public um, comment on that topic um, and then moving on to expenses and then the special fund uh, portion of the presentation. I just wanted to give the public, if there should be any, uh, an opportunity to um, you know, comment before too much material gets um, presented. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to staff. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. We'll take a little moment here to acknowledge the work of Jim Malberg and our entire finance department in putting together the draft budget um, and the entire department head team. It's always a lot of work going through and figuring out where we are with our numbers for this current year and where we think we're going to go next year. So I really want to commend everybody on a great effort. I know Jim was able to do it um, without working late this last couple of weeks, which was uh, a great, good accomplishment. Um, just as a reminder for everybody, this is the first of a series of four scheduled budget hearings. Um, very often we don't end up utilizing all of them, but we certainly can. Uh, we will also, if needed, we can squirrel in some time if we have time in future agendas during our regular meeting time to talk about budget issues uh, should we need that. The purpose for this first hearing is really to give an overview of the budget. Uh, and then it's an opportunity for council members to ask questions, um, some of which we may be able to answer right here at the hearing, some of which would, we would come back at the next budget hearing with a response. If you'd like us to d dive into um, a particular topic, uh, this is a good opportunity to bring that up. Uh, and then we could do that at the next future budget hearing as well. And then lastly, if you have any preliminary feedback or guidance, uh, this is also a great opportunity to do so but you don't have to do it at the first budget meeting. We have other budget hearings down the road to, to get feedback. Uh, so with that, I think I'm prepared to turn it over to Jim. Um, Jim, want to kick us off? Okay, thank you, Jamie. Uh, good evening, Mayor and council members. I will take a moment to share my screen. Does that look okay, Larry? Looks fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so as Jamie mentioned, this is the first of four, so I'll go ahead and get started on kind of the um, full budget overview, and then I'll get into some revenues, and we'll pause for um, the public and then expenditures, and, and then pause again for questions at that point. But um, feel free to stop me at any time as I move through some of these kind of quickly sometimes. So um, as far as the summary, our, our economy continues a strong recovery from the pandemic, but we are beginning, it looks like some, uh, signs of slowing to that as people return back to their normal kind of activities. Um, we do have estimated about 1.1 million of additional ongoing revenue this year from, and when I'm comparing these numbers, I'm comparing to our amended budget um, with the exception of one spot on TOT, where I'll talk about later on. Um, so the 1.1 in addition to the 385,000 of ongoing that we um, identified at the mid-year last fiscal year takes us up to it's about one four, almost one five. Um, approximately, we have approximately 1.2 million of additional ongoing expenditures. And I'll go through those um, on some of these later slides, but our net change of unprogrammed um, ongoing revenue is a reduction of 55,000 down from that 385 in the first proposed draft. Um, we also have three point, just under 3.6 million programs for the adopted city council goals. And we're doing that utilizing uh, general fund balance that we built up over the last couple of years, as well as our fiscal year 22-23 measure F fund of 1.1 million going to the war. Our uh, proposed budget, you probably noticed, is structurally imbalanced by design. Um, so we have 2.6 million of expenditures in excess of revenues, but that was intentional this year. We'll kind of go through that. But even with that, we're still estimating our June 30th, uh, 2023, so ending fiscal year balance at 1.3 million. And then again, we'll still have the $385,000 that was set aside in the resiliency account 
during the um, city council goals. Um, just a reminder, ongoing first pass remain a major threat to city resources. Um, during goal setting, um, the council allocated an additional 500,000 to the first contingency reserve. That'll take our balance up around 1.5 million, but our unfunded um, liability as of June 30th, 2020, which was the last report, was 28 million. I expect that to come down a little bit. Um, PERS had some really good returns, but they also changed a couple of things. So I'm waiting to see what that number is, but that 28 hopefully will drop four or $5 million. Um, we do just a reminder, heavy reliance on sales and transit occupancy tax. We always point out that these are two volatile revenue sources. However, they seem that they held up really well during the um, pandemic. But um, we still have a heavy reliance on them and probably should think about some other diversified uh, revenue sources. Our reserves remain uh, close to the target balances. Just a reminder, contingency is 15% of general fund. We have a little bit over $2 million there. And then um, our emergency is 10% of general fund. We have um, just under 1.5 there. So when I go through these, the uh, city council goals, a lot of those one-time expenditures are hitting contract services. So if I just kind of in a vacuum looked at what the reserve should be this year, it would be a, a pretty large increase to what the balances are. But then as those one-time expenditures drop off next year, it would come kind of back down. So what we've tried to do is look at our target two years out and kind of spread that um, allocation from the general fund into the reserves to get to our targets by the end of next, next fiscal year, 2024. Um, this is just kind of a graph showing where our reserves are. So the bottom is the contingency, that kind of uh, lighter purple is the emergency. So you'll see a little bit of a dip where we pulled the um, $60,000 out for the Noble Gulch Park um, sinkhole repairs. Um, we'll build that back up. And then the um, PERS contingency, you see the increase there with when we make that deposit of 500000 and then we've added a little bit on the top just so we keep track of the resiliency account um, going forward. We don't want to lose funding that. So this is just kind of the summary for the general fund uh, revenues and expenditures by, by categories. Again, this um, the first kind of text in that top circle there is showing that our expenditures are exceeding revenues by about $2.6 million, but we're still ending um, – the year with a budgetary fund balance of 1.3. We also have the resiliency account of 385. So total with um, kind of what we have for ongoing and what we have in the resiliency account, it's going to be a little bit over 1.7 is what we're estimating to end uh, fiscal year 22-23 out. Uh, this is just kind of a graph, the same revenue numbers that were on, on the other page. Um, I think the takeaway on this is you'll see that we dropped in uh, fiscal year 1920 at the onset of the pandemic and we rebounded pretty quickly and now we're kind of projecting that we're going to be holding where we are right now for a couple of years slight increases but nothing really moving the graphs that much a couple of the um, key changes in this year's budget are increases on the revenue side uh, we're seeing a projecting a four percent increase on property tax a little over 114,000 that's coming directly from the county assessor's office. Uh, sales tax, we have at the staff level 3% or 459, that's the Bradley Burns. We're pretty close, HDL is a little lower than us this time, but uh, we're still pretty comfortable with this number, but we'll watch it closely. Sales tax, the district taxes, this is just Measure O, um, just under 129,000, about the same percentage increase. Measure F, it, we'll see the same increase, but since we have that programmed entirely to the ward this year, I didn't include it on this chart, but it is also our table. Um, it is also increasing by about the same amount. The TOT, that's a 5% increase over the amended budget, but uh, we took a note, let's take a look at the TOT numbers and we think we're gonna actually end at about 2.1 million this year. So that's just basically taking next year's budget up to the 2.1 that we think we'll see we are projecting to end out this year. That one I'll be watching really close to see if um, as people start returning
returning to normal activities and possibly vacationing further from home. If our, this is being driven by room rates primarily, so we'll see if room rates start coming down, but we'll keep a pretty close eye on that. Um, charges for services going up a little over 286,000. The majority of that is recreation returning to kind of unrestricted programming and back to their full operations. There's a few other things in there, but that recreation is the primary driver there. And then there's a um, few other miscellaneous ins and outs that net out to a plus 9,000. A couple of notes on that. Um, so overall, general fund revenues are going to increase about 2.6 million, but that includes 1.4 million of the one-time grant money, money coming in this year, um, some American Rescue Plan money, and then um, a couple of planning grants that are, are finishing up this fiscal year. Again, TOT kind of had a spoiler there, um, coming in at 2.1 million. That's about 30% over our highest year prior to the pandemic. So that's the one that I just want to see if it holds there, but it's, it's really doing well. Um, just kind of a reminder, sales tax represents about 55% of general fund revenues with um, about two thirds of that coming from our top 25 generators and a little over lose any of those top 25, um, we feel it pretty quick. Uh, property tax, again, continues 4% growth. That's been pretty consistent for the last three or four years. And I, I think the county's projecting it to maintain at about that 4% growth rate. And then charges for services returning to pre-pandemic levels. So a quick chart. So looking at um, revenues by category, this one is just kind of daylighting or highlighting that about 75% of our revenues come from taxes. And that is broken down. So tax revenues, you'll see about not quite 60% between the Bradley Burns at 43 and then the two measure up and measure O, the two district taxes at just under eight. That comes in just under 60% of total revenues just from sales tax. And then uh, property tax, is at 20% and the TOT is starting to catch up to that at um, a little over 14%. And out of tax revenues, we have our restricted TOT that comes in off of that, um, off of the TOT, obviously TOT taxes. Um, so this is doing better. We had originally when, I think it was Measure J, Measure J or K, um, went through, we had thought that the, um, that the local business groups would be somewhere between 55 and 60, and that the um, early childhood and youth program could be in the high 40s, maybe low 50,000. We're um, see, with the increase in TOT revenue, we're seeing some increased revenues there. And um, I'll talk a little bit more specifically about the early childhood and youth program in a few slides. And I'll pause right there. That's the last of the slides I have on the revenues. Um, if you want to see if anyone has any questions before we move on. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, you know, it appears that we there are still no attendees. Uh, Larry, you haven't received any emails, have you? I have, I have not received any emails. Okay. Um, maybe I'd... It, it, um, the council members, um, any questions concerning the revenues at this time? Or, uh, yeah, council member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, I think this is in relation to to the revenue. Um, in in the budget, proposed budget, we we do talk about the mall, and I believe when the conceptual review was brought to us, three years ago um, and we look at what would happen if we broke ground we were looking at a million dollar loss annual loss how are we building that in because there was one slide you showed with the three-year projection maybe this is it no it was like a few slides ago maybe um, that it looked pretty even where are how are we planning for that and and where where is that City Manager Goldstein, ready for this one? Sure, I'll take a swing at it. 
So our long range projection right now, we're actually not showing the mall project occurring, not because we don't think it's going to, but for a while we kept showing it in our long range projection every year and then we just kept pushing it out. So right now it's not showing up in the long range projection, but you're absolutely right. We estimated the impact of mall redevelopment that would take place over a period of two to three years and estimated the revenue impacts to the city would be in the order of a million dollars. The tentative and, you know, and this would be subject to council approval, but the tentative internal plan has been that that's probably where we would look to utilize the PERS trust is because the PERS trust could be used to make specific PERS payments in the years that were down, uh, which could offset those revenue impacts. The challenge, of course, and this is something Jim and I have spoken about a lot, is that you know you want to be very sure because it doesn't make sense right to scale the city back for two or three years conceivably lay people off and then have to rehire you just have to have a high degree of confidence we would that the project would come to fruition so that's the tentative internal plan um and it's not without risk obviously because you know you, you do see projects that start and don't finish um but would be to utilize the purse trust to help stabilize the revenue stream during all redevelopment and how much do we currently have? What page is that on? I, I, and I guess I, I, I bring this up because I don't remember which meeting it was at that we discussed having it shown on our budget. You know, you know when we looked at projections, um, and I, I just don't want to to lose sight of that, especially as we move into how we want to use the. I don't want to say extra money we have that's the wrong term but you know that that this is something that council needs to to make sure we're we're planning for i'll leave it to jim to talk about in our budget where we talk about the first trust the current balance in the first trust i think jim just covered that in the previous slides about 1.5 million is that correct jim uh current balance is about 1 million uh, council goal was to make an additional deposit of 500 to take us to the 1.5. It should be in the reserves section on the budget. Yeah, okay, and, and it is. And I remember council bringing this up as a priority at our last, or not as a priority, but uh, yeah, or as our, yeah, one of our priorities to shift the money over there, but we didn't talk that about that it was going to be just to utilize if the mall broke ground and I don't know that we've had the conversation and you can remind me jamie if we had we did or not whether that was going to be enough so if we have a million every year and it's going to take several years it just might not be enough i just i'm curious what your thoughts are on that and i think when we did the analysis we came to a total impact of around i think it was just a bit north of a million if you does seem right jim yes so that was the multi-year impact council member brooks so I do think that the PERS fund right now, if we make this allocation of 500K, should be sufficient to take us through redevelopment of the mall as we anticipated it happening. Um, so that is sort of the internal tentative plan, but like I said, we've never, we haven't taken that to council for adoption as a formal. I will also probably wouldn't recommend adopting a formal plan because you know we don't know exactly right. what the project's gonna look like when it's gonna happen. But that's been sort of our internal back pocket of what, what we think we would propose to do if the mall project all of a sudden went into high gear and in the near term we were looking at those kinds of revenue decreases, temporary revenue decreases. And, and just for clarification, the one one million that you anticipated in loss of, of revenue, um, that was overall, should the project take two to three years? I thought it was an annual loss. That was overall. That was a cumulative loss. And oh, phasing, okay. Yeah, we were phasing in some of the new revenues coming in over time and phasing out. So it, it, there was a little bit of work. Jim, Jim, do you want to shed any light on that, if you remember? Uh, I, I want to say it was we were planning on about a two and a half year to three year construction window, and that we were, like you said, just a little bit over a million dollars over that entire time frame. Okay, and and one last question, Jim. You mentioned that if we did lose, so one of our five, that they in total bring in a certain amount, which was, I don't see it here, 38% of something. 
Um, and what would that cost? What is 38%? And if we would lose that, where would where would we go for funds? Presumably, if we lost one, we would hopefully get another big sales tax generator in its place. So the example that I would have is Orchard Supply left and then Outdoor Supply Hardware came in after right. and has kind of made up for that loss. I want to say Orchard Supply was in our top 10 and um, Outdoor Supply Hardware is probably getting close to that if they're not already in there. Um, so my question is, if we lost one of the big five, which might be likely in the next couple of years, what would that loss look like? And where would we, um, it, it would take time for a new place to come in. Where would we find that revenue or find that money to backfill that loss? Um, reserves is though, it would depend on which of the five. The five slides are, are a pretty different level. Um, from number one to number five is a totally different level. So losing a num number one would hurt much more than losing number five. Um, we have reserves, um, contingency reserves that would probably fill the gap while we made up, um, while we looked or, or waited for another vendor to come in. But I mean, they're, they're bigger, bigger operations. So you're right, it would take some time to get somebody in. But I think reserves, uh, general fund balance, and then we would probably if it was long term have to start looking at some uh, modifications to our expenditure. By way of reference in 2010, we lost several businesses in the top five, if not top top 10, if not top five, uh, got shocks, um, the Honda dealership. And the way we approached that was we had a limited hit. We actually utilized fund balance. I don't think we actually ended up using reserves but we restructured sort of city services to cut back just because the timeline of when those businesses would um, be reoccupied wasn't known. And so we rescaled the city's operation around that pretty, pretty dramatically and pretty quickly. So I think that if we did see impacts, particularly those top couple ones that really are very significant revenue sources for the city, we would be talking very quickly about what kind of adjustments we would make to city expenditures. Yeah, I make this point because this is a two-year budget proposal, and I we're we're not seeing much change in terms of the big five generators. And because we have a surplus of funds at this point, would it make this make it? What you know? Should we be having these conversations of what to to save money? just in case one of these close. And I don't know if staff, so the question is, I don't know if staff has had this conversation, whether council should look at this. And I know I should have brought this up in priorities, but now understanding how much it's 38% of the total of our sales tax, that's pretty significant. It is one of the things that keeps me up at night, for sure. I would love to be a city that rely mostly on property tax, which is far more stable. Um, you've probably all heard me say that before in the past. So, you know, I do, I would, Note that we do have $500,000 at this point going into the PERS trust, which in some senses is a form of contingency, and you put the 385 into the uh, resiliency fund. So the city council has directed a significant investment in sort of stability and reserves um, already. So, you know, I don't want everyone to feel bad about uh, what we've already sort of programmed into the budget is that there's definitely, it's not, uh, we're not spending every dime that we've got. We're definitely squirreling a fair amount of money away. But I, I, I really appreciate the concern because, like I said, it does keep me up at night too. Thank you. And following up that, and I'll call on you in just a minute, uh, Councilmember Bertrand. But following up on that um, question about the sources of sales tax revenues, I was looking at the chart on page 24 of the breakout on page 24 of the draft budget. Um, where it identifies the sources by area. One, I, I didn't see listed um, um, sales taxes from uh, internet sales. Um, do we track that separately? Are we able to do that? Um, so we, we can get a, maybe a sense of how that's spending. We do track it separately. We haven't reported it in the past. Um, 
we we get a we get our funding allocated from internet sales through the county pool, uh, which is more complicated than we need to go into right now, which it includes, it's about two thirds internet sales. And I think it was one third DMV used motor vehicles, if I remember right, somewhere around there. Uh, we can bring that back and show you the trend because it is actually a very interesting trend to look at. Um, and we can even talk more about it at the next budget hearing if you'd like to get some more details. Well, I, yeah, I, I would certainly be interested in seeing that and I think you know, going to Council Member Brooks's, um, you know, point about what are some of the alternatives, I think that that is going to be one for us to kind of watch and track um, and, um, and to see how that's trending. Um, so, um, so thank you. Yeah, I, I would be interested in seeing that. And now I'll, I'll call on Council Member Bertrand. Commuted, yeah, um, so Mike, you made a, a comment about um, our trends are going down a little bit, and I was just wondering if uh, Jim, rather, if you could comment about that, and is that reflected in other communities around here? I was wondering if it's just us, or is there, you know, like you said, coming out of the pandemic, so that's the first question, then after you answer that and give us a better understanding, I have a second question. Sure. So um, it was interesting. We met with, um, Jamie and I met with HDL, our sales tax consultant. I think that was earlier this week. Um, yeah, Monday. And um, they give us kind of an overview of the state and then the region. And it was interesting to see that um, our growth in certain areas was far less than in other regions. That's what we were looking at the last quarter of last calendar year, so October or yeah, October through December of last year, and um, other regions are growing much faster. And and HDL's take on it was we didn't come down as far as other areas, so we're we don't have as much to build back up. So um, other areas are starts are are still seeing some double digit growth in some of their revenues, while we aren't quite seeing that here and. And we believe it's because we just didn't fall off that far. When when the shelter kind of lifted, they were still in place, but they lifted. We had a lot of people come to this area rather than flying and going other places. So it, it didn't hit us as hard. So our recovery looked smaller, I guess. That so are we thinking about restaurants and our um, hotels uh, so people can enjoy the recreation around here? Is that it? We didn't drop as much in those areas. I'm just trying to get an idea what shares did not drop as much. Yeah, Council Member Bertrand. So if you remember back in later, it was sort of late fall, late summer 2020 into the winter. So much of the rest of the state was still pretty shut down, and it did not feel that way around Capitola, if you'll recall. Right. Uh, there was a lot of folks. Uh, there were actually our sales tax consultant mentioned that that's where that's where her daughter was going every weekend. Um, and so when we do the year over year comparisons, we always do a year over year comparison. So when we look at this last winter, October, November, December of 21, we were growing as a region, I think it was like 4% or something, Jim. Yeah. And like a lot of other places around the state were growing at 12. And the reasoning was because it was just so many people were coming to the beach back in 20 and our revenues were surprisingly strong then. Remember we kept getting surprised last year with how good we were doing. So. That's, that's a little bit of what Jim's referring to. And then in addition, we haven't really seen direct evidence of the slowdown so far in our revenue stream. What Jim is talking about is slowdown in the economy. It's more based on input from HDL and looking and monitoring sort of nationwide and statewide trends where you may have seen, um, there was actually a report of some economic contraction last quarter at the national level. So, you know, everything is still in flux, um, but at this point we haven't seen an actual signal of a slowdown in, in, in economic growth in the city, but it seems as if nationwide and statewide, there may be some signs of that starting to pick up. Um, thank you, city manager. So uh, we have a, a, um, an existing hotel above the post office box, and excuse me, post office facility. Um, when's that due to come online? I don't know the status, you know, it hasn't come to city council. I don't even know if it's in city planning yet, but. I heard that they they're moving on the conceptual and 
So I'm trying to get an idea how much boost would that be? I don't think it's much, but I'm just trying to get an idea. So uh, if our community development director is on, she could talk about the pending schedule for consideration of the application for the Hill Street Hotel. Katie, if you're on. Yes, can you hear me? Um, so for the Hill Street Hotel, we're hoping to take that forward to Planning Commission this summer. So either at the July or August meeting of this summer. And then from there, they'll develop their building plans. And um, they've just finished up their um, CEQA analysis. And so we're putting together the whole package and getting it ready for Planning Commission in July or August. Um, and planning, oh, excuse me. I was just you know, wondering how many more rooms, you know, I, I forgot what the projected room increase was, but I think it was over 50%, but I'm just trying to get an idea. So that could give us an estimate. Let me, I'm gonna uh, open the plan. I wanted to say it's close to like uh, in the high 40s. Um, oh, okay, not 50, okay, high 40s. Let me, I'll, I'll confirm that for you. Well, that's a rough, I mean, I'm not counting rooms yet, I guess. And I think ballpark, just to get your sort of, give you kind of a frame of reference, I think <clears throat> around 40 to 50 rooms, um, if it performs like other sort of similar hotels, we'd probably be looking at something around 300, three to four. Mm. But if it does get final approval from planning, you know, that doesn't mean that it's up and operational. Um, I presume it's probably around a, six month period to finalize their building permits and building plans and then you know an 18 month construction cycle so if it was approved this summer we're probably looking at two summers out so it'd be summer 25 would be the best case scenario of when something like that would come online something i always worry about i think we all worry about is uh, working with the neighbors has that process started they have. They've worked with um, the the owner has reached out to the neighbors and has been working with the neighbors um, right next to the hotel. Great. Good news. They've had a few meetings. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. That's the end of my questions. Okay. Um, thank you, Councilmember Bertrand. Um, seeing no other questions from other council members, um, Jim, I, I just I did have one question on uh, the detail revenue summary detail on page 14 of the draft budget um, and this is the um, under the internal services fund and transfer from the equipment replacement um, this year um, it's proposed that it be a hundred and five thousand um, and in the um, Current year it's 411, and I was just wondering if well, one it was that um, seems to be a significant drop, um, and um, I was just wondering where is the um, uh, or I should ask is the new um, electric street sweeper um, you know included in that? I was I guess I was expecting to see bigger numbers because of that purchase. Sure, so um, on the equipment fund, we've moved the 300,000, I believe is what council directed at mid-year into the equipment fund already. Um, I believe, yeah, that, I think this is, a, I'm not um, stealing anyone else's thunder. We've been approved for a grant of up to 250, I believe, um, which brings our total funding to um, around 650,000 and that money is in other than the 250 that's on a reimbursement basis but the funding for the electric suite for the city's portion is already in the equipment fund so the 105 that you're seeing on page 14 is the um, internal service fund to this year it will be um, the police department and uh, recreation for a lifeguard tower is what we're funding right there. Okay, so, so we, all right, so we don't have a lot of things scheduled in the next you know, budget year for 
No, we have, um, we, last year we had two police vehicles. I, we've taken delivery of one. I haven't seen the second one. I think it will be here soon. We had a, um, a three quarter ton truck with a dump bed that I still, if I remember what last time I talked to Steve, is still six to nine months out. So we do have that purchase from the year that we're in, but it's already funded. And then um, again, the street sweepers in there. So yeah, there's a lot of activity if we can get the uh, supply chains to cooperate. And um, thank you for that. Um, and also I had a, you know, a, a question since you brought up our emergency and contingency reserves. Um, and, um, and just maybe this is a request for the next presentation. It was a little difficult for me to track what is, you know, what is 10% and what is 15%. I know it's supposed to be against expenditures, but it looks like it's expenditures, less internal service funds and kind of um, and, and, and internal transfers. Um, so I was, I wanted to ask maybe next time, I mean, we could see some, maybe some, the actual allocations of what we're pegging the bottom line expenditures against those required reserves. Um, Cause it seems like we're a little bit behind um, and, um, and, and I think this may be a closer eye um, on, on those uh, particular reserves. Sure, I have, um, I have the calculations on pages 108 and 109 of the budget, but I can definitely for the next, um, next hearing go into a little more detail and provide more detail on what the plan is and how we come up with that calculation. Yeah, I see, yeah, I, yeah, I see it on page 108, 109, but it, you know, it says general fund expenditures excluding transfers and, well, e, EFF and LSF, but it doesn't identify what those, what those numbers are. Okay. Yeah, I'll so, definitely, um, at the next hearing, I'll break that out, so it's much more clear, for sure. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, and Councilmember Bertrand, did you have your hand up again? No? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Jim, and you can uh, carry on with your presentation. Thank you. So expenditures, sorry, hopefully nobody's getting car sick here. Um, so this is just kind of the overall summary. Uh, you saw that on the general fund summary. This is kind of just a review of that slide and putting, putting it into a graph. You see a little bit of the increase there for the proposed budget, um, which a lot of that's driven by the city council goals this year in 3.5 million. Um, some of the, the key changes uh, on the personnel. So these are just the main categories within our expenditures. Now I have some slides on, um, especially the personnel, a little bit on contract services later on. Um, personnel, we're looking at a little over 800, almost $809,000 increase. Our notes on that is that it does include 1.8. 0.8 is about 1,700 hours of a position. Um, of new positions, it is returning, requesting to return two currently frozen positions, but it also maintains a total between um, a frozen position and a handful of positions that we have that are partially filled. Um, so there's a lot of moving pieces of personnel right now to get to that 808. That 808 also includes 200,000 of PERS UAL cost in there. Um, contract services is going up 500,000. That's primarily driven by city council goals. Um, as I mentioned, some of the things that we're doing um, here at City Hall, the community center, um, bike and pedestrian safety, um, those are contract services, uh, one-time expenses. So that's the primary driver there. Um, training and membership, as well as supplies, that's kind of normal annual movements up and down, depending on um, what's going on at the time. Internal service funds, almost a $210,000 increase, with over half of that coming just from our insurance premiums going to Ambasia. They um, held them down a little bit through the pandemic and, and utilized their credit last year, so we kind of anticipated an increase. I don't know if we anticipated this much, but... Um, we did anticipate an increase there. So to drill 
down a little bit into some of those items on personnel, the 808, as I mentioned, there's two, a total of two FTEs when you put them all together between um, one three quarter time frozen position and then some partial, partially filled positions in um, the city manager's office, community, uh, building and PD, I think that's all of them. Um, the increase to the CalPERS UAL again, 112,000. It was 280 last year, 212 this year. It, based on the last actuarial, it looks like those annual increases are going to be, are going to start coming down and hopefully leveling off here in the near future. Um, we hear that a lot from PERS and it's been dragging on for years, but I think we're getting to that point where we're starting to see a decrease in the annual additions, if that makes sense. Um, uh, as you recall, we did uh, all bargaining groups negotiated new MOUs last year, all of them agreed to 3% COLAs. Management was actually a little bit less than that, but there were some other things that overall it's 3% COLA, um, as well as step increases. So that's about a little over 264,000. Um, the steps I was mentioning to the back last night, the positions that were frozen were primarily, well not primarily, but from a lot of folks that had been here a while and retired. Um, so now that we're backfilling those, we're they were at the top steps, so we weren't seeing as big of an increase in the steps. So a lot of that increase is tied to the, or about a percent of that increase is tied to those steps. Um, additional staffing, a little over 332,000. So I mentioned the police officer that was frozen at the onset of the pandemic. Right now, um, council has authorized us to overfill that position. So we can go ahead and fill it um, in anticipation of a retirement that will be occurring, I believe, in early July. Under our, the way we sit right now, that position would then become vacant and frozen again. So we're requesting to be able to fill that on a permanent basis going forward or on a regular basis going forward. Um, the receptionist was frozen at the onset of the pandemic. Um, that one, we kind of looked at the positions that are underfilled and um, the, the one that's vacant. And if we could pick one that kind of helped everybody, this seemed to be the one um, where we could kind of take the whole um, interacting with customers as they come into the lobby rather than the doorbell, the phones, the mail, and all of that stuff. Right now, it's just kind of a hodgepodge of whoever's available does it. Um, it would be helpful, I think, to all if we had the receptionist back. Um, the development services technician is a new position in public works. Um, I have some, we'll, we'll focus on staffing a little bit later. If you have questions on what that is exactly, um, I think Steve can help out with there. Um, 80% or 1,700 hours a year of a recreation coordinator. That's a new position in recreation for junior guards and lifeguards. Um, I, we talked about changing the way we operate our lifeguard program, um, and that's kind of what this is resulting in. That one actually nets out to not very much increase by the time we're all done. Um, and Beja, I previously mentioned um, the beach shuttle. We're bringing back the beach shuttle. Last year, we only had a budget of 16,000 because it um, wasn't running much at all, if it did. Um, so we're taking that up. That's actually a pretty significant increase. There prior, prior to the pandemic, we were at about 35 to $40,000 a year. That's going up significantly and that's reflected there. Our 911 JPA, so the call center, 911 call center, 911 call center for um, Safety up at uh, De La Vega, our, the operational cost is, has some pretty big increases this year, and this is Capitola's portion. Um, public Works Engineering, something that we had cut at the beginning of the pandemic, trying to bring that back. Gas and electric utilities, that's just inflation driving those right there, but um, pretty significant increase across all city facilities of 25,000. The general admin contract, something we had cut at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, some of that applies to um, ADA compliance, but that increases 50 grand. Um, the lifeguard contract, I mentioned that we are changing our, the way we operate our lifeguard program, so we'll actually be getting rid of the lifeguard contract that we have with Santa Cruz City. Um, Nikki and, and Jamie can give you specifics on timing on that. Um, but last year we had a budget of 95. That was going to increase to 110 this year, and I think another big jump in the next year, so that's why we're kind of changing our, our model. And then just everything else, kind of miscellaneous catch-all stuff, up and downs, and inflation comes to about 82,000. 
So by department, breaking out expenditures by department, you can see um, police and public works is about 70%. Public safety, public infrastructure, and maintenance, and then um, those that kind of support that, and then um, building and um, recreation and uh, community development, everything makes up the other 30%. When you break it out by categories, public agencies or service industry, so about two thirds of our cost is made up of personnel costs. 21.5% of contract services, and then the remaining, I think that's about 12% or so, um, goes to the other categories of supplies, training, grants, and um, internal service charges. You know, I can pause right here for the expenditures because I'm going to get into um, staffing and then a couple of multi year projections if you like. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Why don't we? Uh, go back. I, I, it looks like there's no attendees. So, do, do you notice any um, emails? Mayor Story, we don't have any emails on this item. Okay. Um, then I'll call on Councilmember Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, I just had a question about. I'm actually not sure what it's called. It's our council travel, mm -hmm. and I believe we were supposed to bring that back to what it was, and I'm not seeing that. No, that is um, absolutely correct. That was one we missed in this first round. So when I get towards the end, I have kind of my punch list of, of budget amendments that we need to consider going forward and returning city council travel back up to the 10,000 is at the top of that list. Okay, and then for our implicit bias training um, as an expenditure, so this is kind of tricky because I would ideally like, I don't know that we actually as a full council have talked about the re how often we were going to have staff participate implicit in implicit bias training. Um, after some of my own research, it seems that the average is every two years. How are you including that in this particular budget and forecast? So for training and memberships, I don't call out those on the big one um, on kind of the overview. For implicit bias training, I believe we get some money reimbursed from Ambasia. I think um, dollar-wise, it's not a very big ticket item in the grand scheme of um, overall training and membership citywide. So I don't have it called out. It kind of just the dollars are low. It gets absorbed um, as we go through. We have a few trainings that we do that are, are um, every other year like that that we just kind of program them in as we need them. Elections work kind of the same way. You'll see election costs go up, then they disappear, then they go back up. So I think this would work kind of the same way. We, we'll build it in on whatever the schedule is that the council decides on and then just make sure. Okay. I, I personally would like to see it called out in some way so that it doesn't get lost um, in terms of reoccurrence and, and necessity. And then um, in terms of staffing, I'm looking at council compensation and I believe it was right when I ca came on to so three years ago um, when council reviewed our compensation and I'm wondering if this would be an appropriate time to request the um, a potential increase to get closer to what we just because I, I believe we were several hundred away from the, an increase and I'm wondering if this is an appropriate time to request staff bring back that information and how it would affect our expenditure forecast. Um, so I, I think and Jamie can correct me if I'm wrong here I think that request should go through the SAC and then the SAC looks at it and makes a recommendation back to city council. It keeps a little bit of separation between the council members and and being the only decision maker in your own pay, if you will. Um, it, can, it can go up annually. It just has to go before council each time. I don't believe that you can build in, like with our MOUs, we have 3% cost of living adjustment. I don't believe we can do that for city council. I think it has to be kind of requested and, and all of that. But you are correct. I believe at the time, the uh, it could have been raised up to, it was between 950 and $1,000 a month. And I think it we only moved it from 500 to 600. So there was definitely some bandwidth in there. Um, the other
other rule or law or whatever you want to call it is if we put that to the fact now and then they make a recommendation and council approves it for increasing it doesn't go into effect until after the next election so we would if that's the um, desire of the council to put that in front of the fact i would want to do that relatively quickly um, otherwise you're going to do something and if we don't if we're not done by november then it sits for another two years i'm going to nod and i don't know what kind of council consensus you need but i'll let <laughs> i see council member perchance giving a thumbs up mayor story <laughs> well, i think the request is, is maybe going back because as I recall, there was a kind of a comparative study. Um, and uh, it seems like that's just an information item that could be brought back through the fact. Um, and Jim, you could mention that, uh, you know, this, um, you know, request and, um, and have the fact look at that study um, and make a recommendation back to the council. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Jim. Oh, just what I, I didn't answer, and, and I don't mean this to be <laughs> insulting in any ways, but um, changing the city council compensation a couple of hundred dollars a month in the grand scheme of things is not going to really have that big of an impact on our overall budget. I appreciate that, Jim. Thank you. Um, let's see. I, I had Clean council, oh, council member Brown stepped away. So I'll call on council member Bertrand. Thank you very much. Um, so Jim, you mentioned Ambasia. I'm very concerned about the increase in that um, charge for us. And are we looking at that in terms of where the um, costs are being driven or what the costs are being driven that raises I mean, I'm sure there's a general rise, but, you know, are we seeing more people tripping over sidewalks or uh, suits or of any other sort or, you know, so I kind of like, you know, when you come back to us to give us a rough idea where, where the drivers are. Basically, I'd like to see it, you know, looked at a little closer so we have some control over it. And then if improvements are, are needed, we could focus. So, so I can give you a little bit. Yeah, you can come back on that. I'm, I don't need an answer right now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because it could be a more complete one when Jim works it over. Um, the yeah. other thing, the other thing is um, there was a, a, a thing that you mentioned, ADA compliance. I remember, I think it's been about two years now, um, we did a, a basic city survey. Is this connected with that and we're still chomping away at the various things? Maybe Steve can answer that. Just trying to get a better idea of that. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Council Member Bertrand, uh, yes, that item not necessarily has a to-do list. It's, uh, we, we budget that annually to, to do ADA improvements at either a facility or a street. Um, sometimes we put it into our project bank. The last ADA funding was actually went into part of a, a library project. Um, so we'll be looking for ADA improvements to do uh, in the next fiscal year. And you'll know, obviously see parts of that as we, as we spend it. But it is an annual um, allocation we make just to do ADA improvements throughout the city. Okay. So my concern is, you know, I, I hear all the time about lawyers up and down California bringing suits because of ADA lack of compliance. So the fact that we're working on this, does that protect us? I mean, there's many things that that study showed, but the fact that they were working on things as they've been, you know, uh, highlighted, I guess, does that protect us? I just want to understand that. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, yeah, so we have a transition plan. I think that's what you're referring to. And okay. That identifies all the um, shortcomings in, in the city, and it does provide protection as long as we are continually working on that. The level of protection, I would ha wouldn't want to hazard a guess, though. Okay, but in court, it's been recognized that we can't, I mean, I, I'm just, that maybe uh, Sam could, I don't know if Sam's here. 
but I'm trying to understand this because we, we have so many. I, I saw the report. I think it was two boxes. <laughs> it was huge. So um, you know, I'm trying to understand what kind of liability we have. We, 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 you know, it's an older city, relatively speaking. So we have tons of things out there. So I'm just trying to get a better idea of you know what kind of um, situation we're in in terms of um, potential problems. I don't know. You know, we, we had one ADA suit against the city. That was before we had our transition plan in place, or it wasn't updated. We, we've now updated it. Um, it does provide a level of protection um, as long as we kind of prove that we're continuing. There's no way we could go out and build it all. It'd be millions and millions of dollars to, to fix everything in the city at a given time. So the courts recognize that. But again, I can't tell you uh, what level of protection it provides. Okay, so the courts have recognized it. I, I suppose it somewhat depends on how egregious the issue is. So if we ignored an egregious issue that clearly needed some attention right away, and we put it at the end of the list, then maybe that, you know, since we know it's there, it would uh, maybe open itself for a suit. Is, is it something of that sort? And have, does our plan recognize, you know, the difficulties, not necessarily the difficulties, but the um, the issues in terms of the uh, hazard to ADA community. It doesn't rank them on severity. No, it does not. Um, right now we use the report, for example, the Clare Street project. We went through and looked at all the uh, issues that were brought up along Clare Street and the intersection, and we are fixing those as part of the project. Um, we're using it in, in that light right now. Um, more than we are scheduling repairs, and it does not, it does not do any ranking. So yeah. Okay, uh, so we fall short. Okay, no thanks. Um, so my question to Sam when she comes on regular session is, you know, I kind of like some guidance to the city council on that because uh, the report rather extensive, and like I said, there may be things that are quite egregious and potentially very dangerous to members of the ADA community. And um, I mean, community um, like those don't work, whatever. And maybe you know, it begs to take those right away rather than you know other things that are less dangerous. So that's just a concern that I kind of like an answer to. Thank you, um, Council Member Bertrand. Just to be clear, are, are you asking for an agenda item on a future council agenda? on that question or well if it rises to the level of the agenda i am fine um i, I just posed it in terms of a question of sam if, if sam feels that this really needs some attention as an agenda item then it should be but you know well, usually she has a sense of you know what other cities have done and what the law is around the state of california and right. i i just want to know think, yeah she could give you that information or all of us that information all oh, right. Um, so why, why don't we just, you know, yeah, it'll be uh, conveyed to Sam and uh, maybe she could prepare something on the question about, um, you know, how our efforts may impact our level of liability. Uh, but on the question of the particular project, isn't that, that, that comes to us in the CIP um, portion of the budget. No, I understand that. Um, well, I, that was a question. I wasn't. Trying to oh, make okay, okay, sorry. So the thing that comes to me is the ramp on the other side of the um, the uh, Soquel River, right? And you know, someone fell off of that, and you know, we we knew we were, weren't in compliance at the time. I think it was a wheelchair that fell off, and then we had to redo it because the angle wasn't correct, <laughs> and and that was quite expensive. And, you know, the person, I actually met the person and, you know, she was rather severely hurt. So I understand, you know, the whole issue from her perspective, but from our perspective, do we know ahead of time, you know, I, I'm, I'm just trying to get a better idea. I just don't want to see the city hit by things now that we have a pretty good inventory of what's out there that needs to be corrected. Okay. Well, um, I think we've got um, some direction. Uh, on that question, um, let's see. I, yeah, Councilmember Brown, you didn't. I, I thought I saw your hand up, but is I, that? 
I had for a second, I had a, a question about the next slide that had some of the staffing on it. I thought I saw that the treasurer was still included, but I see now uh, on that line item that they stopped including the treasurer uh, as a personnel cost when we decided that we no longer needed a treasurer. So I put my hand down, but okay. thank okay. you for noticing. Good. Um, yeah, and Jim, I, I, I had one request about, um, and this is on page 33, um, and this is uh, on behalf of the Art and Cultural Commission. I noticed that, that we have for expenditures uh, $58,004, um, and I know some of that is for staff support, um, but our is the balance of those expenditures pegged to particular identified projects? And the reason I ask that is because, um, you know, at the last meeting, they asked for a modest $1,500 um, to be used to a um, commemorative uh, Begonia Festival uh, event um, over the next Labor Day weekend. Um, and I just wanted to, um, you know, see whether um, all that current money in the, uh, for the Art and Cultural Commission was, was already committed, um, and, um, and, if, and if not, I mean, I think that we could utilize that for, you know, the $1,500 for them for that particular event. Um, but if it is committed, then, yeah, I would need to, you know, try to maybe see if I could get an additional $1,500 approved somehow. Um, off the top of my head, I do not know um, exactly what's committed already. Yeah, and I'm not aware. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> just saying, I, I'm not aware. I haven't seen a list of particular arts projects and, and budgets attached to them. So. <clears throat> You can see the breakout of the Art and Cultural Commission budget, the 58,000 on page 75. And then I think um, Larry is here and you can talk a little bit more deeply about what goes into some of those different line items. Mayor Story, um, council members, I, the, the event that you're talking about was not included in the budget. Um, the line items that the things that were included were for the Twilight concert, um, Plain Air, the movies, and if I could remember something else, but those those are the main things. But this I, this event was not included in those in those numbers. Okay. Well, I would like to ask maybe staff to see if they could maybe find us fifteen hundred dollars for that um, commemorative Begonia event. It's um, kind of a joint event um, among the Arts Commission, the um, our museum. Uh, and the beach festival. So, um, so with that, I'll I'll turn it back over to you, Jim, to proceed uh, with the staffing report. For me. Thank you, Mayor. So, um, this this is just kind of a chart that shows the um, staffing. Oh, there's the elected treasurer. I hadn't even noticed that was still on there. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so what this is showing is kind of the history of what our positions were, how we dropped during the pandemic. Um, the two right columns are for this year, and I have a proposed authorized, which is um, keeping staffing how it was at the pre-pandemic and then adding the additional staffing that I mentioned on the previous slides is how this is in the proposed budget, a proposed authorized. And then in the budget, it's funding the one that I was talking about. So it's maintaining the um, two vacancies. Those numbers are slightly off. I have a, um, our development services tech in building is split a little bit. And I just caught, when I was looking at this right before the meeting, I realized I haven't accounted for him. So it's, we have like two and a quarter positions that are either vacant or partially filled. And we're proposing to keep it that way. Um, for multi-budget year projection, so the top part of this with the blue outline is showing um, what our projections are with uh, our revenue projections uh, on the key revenues, so property tax, sales tax, CSD, um, business license, um, cannabis, and parking. Um, property tax, I think I mentioned um, uh, we're holding at about 4% a year for the foreseeable future. Um, sales tax, we have it um, at 3%. 
this year, 2% and then decline. And that's kind of based on what we heard from HDL. Uh, TOT, again, that, that 5% increase this year is from the amended budget. And that's just basically getting us to match what we think our actuals were. I don't have any growth in 24 because, again, <laughs> probably beating this dead horse, but that one's making me nervous. Um, but hopefully, um, I think um, Councilmember Bertrand mentioned the hotel coming online. So hopefully that does happen in 2025 and we start seeing an uptick there. Business license, um, we're seeing that rebound and getting back to pre-pandemic levels. So this is kind of how we um, are, are traditional, what we've seen increase-wise. Uh, building permits came up quite a bit during the pandemic. So right now we're holding that flat. We're seeing really high building permit revenue, looking at it over a two-year period. So we think that's going to kind of hold flat right now. Um, the cannabis business tax we're holding flat. We have a budget of 360. I think they're going to be really close to that. Um, my side note is, is that we, um, I believe we are currently conducting an audit um, on the cannabis business tax. They're required to go through an audit annually. So if we anything comes out of that audit that changes these numbers around, then um, we'll amend this going forward. As far as... Um, Revenues and expenditures and net impact on the budget. So for this proposed budget right now, as I mentioned, uh, we're showing expenditures and excess of revenues for 2.6 million. I've got the next four years in the projection balanced out, but that's only by an increasing increasing contribution of Measure F revenues. Um, and then you'll see in fiscal year 28, Measure F ends December 31st of 2027. So in fiscal year 28, we only have half a year of measure F, and that's why we see that go structurally out of balance. Um, so we have a little bit of time to address that, but don't want to lose sight of that we're using measure F. And what this um, is kind of showing me is uh, we, we've talked about this ongoing unspent, unprogrammed revenue, but the fact that we're dipping into measure F next year, um, it looks like our expenditures and what we know are outpacing our revenue projections. So. Um, we'll have to keep a close eye on that because um, using Measure F to balance, using a, a expiring sales tax, and district tax rather to balance our budget is probably not a good long-term solution. Um, so this is just a, um, a recap. So the new revenues, one-time revenues, the uh, um, $1.4 million of the grants, and then um, the other $1.1 million or so there of ongoing, which includes the um, – or I'm sorry, 1.1 from this year, as well as the 385 from prior year. This is just putting all of those things on the new expenditures, new ongoing expenditures, as well as the one-time city council goals into one page. And the point of those two slides was to get to this slide. So our net change, we had started the year with basically $385,000 of ongoing revenue that we hadn't programmed. All of the changes that we have in at this stage of the proposed budget decrease that by 55,000. So we're projecting at the end of fiscal year 23, based on 23 expenditures, that we would have 333,000 of ongoing revenue that hasn't been programmed in this year. But um, when I, was, I talked about this last night at the fact and looking at it uh, this morning, I think our um, known contract expenses and known personnel expenses going up in the next couple of years along and personnel, including our UAL really sucks up most of that 330 um, in future years. Um, I have this slide just to um, kind of summarize. This was the city council goals and all of that. I don't, we don't necessarily need to go line by item, line item by line by for this one. I have it up here just to kind of remember, remind everybody of what um, the 3.5 million is programmed towards. And then when we get later on and we start doing, um, if we need to make any tweaks or, or adjustments to this, we can come back and reference this list. Yes, Council Member Brooks. Yeah, I'm, I'm Mayor Story, if I may address something on here, if that's okay. Of course, go ahead. Um, so for Council, I, I just wanna let all of you know that I've done a, a bit of research on the library tot lot. Um, I brought it to you before about um, wanting to utilize this funding to 
update it to be um, what we call universally designed. Um, after talking to, to some folks who do this, um, they actually suggested that there's more room, more opportunity at the play structure at Jade Street Park. Currently the tot lot already has the spongy stuff and things that are just kind of low hanging fruit to make it um, accessible, whereas Jade Street Park does not. And I'm think, um, what I'd like to see is that this particular fund, instead of going to the library tot lot, to be moved to Jade Street Park for, for such repairs. So that's what I had. Mayor, if I may. Yeah, go ahead, Council Member Bertrand. Uh, yeah, I um, thank you very much, for, Yvette, for bringing that up, because uh, about once a week or twice a week, I go to both lots and, you know, the one at J Street is heavily used, relatively speaking. And um, so I think, you know, it would be well received there for more kids. So thanks for making that observation and I totally support that. Thank you. Jim, my question is, can you remind me with the total of funding, what, how close we are to expending what we, were allotted, was it four million? Was it three, three million five hundred? What was that total? Um, what we're left with right now is um, projecting about a $1.3 million ending fund balance. So we have about 1.3 million general fund dollars that have not been programmed. And we have the resiliency fund as well. And how will we be seeing what What's your plan? <laughs> so I have, uh, when I get towards the end, uh, uh, I have some slides on key discussion points. So it includes staffing, Excellent. it includes okay. early childhood, and then um, also the fund balance discussion. Great, thank but you. I, I just kind of wanted to tee this one up because there are some resources that council could decide to, to allocate and, or move things around on this particular list. Um, so I just kind of put that up there, but we can definitely come back to this list. Thank you. Oh, and there it is discussion point staffing. Um, so just to kind of review this, and I'll pause after this slide and kind of get a feel from what the council, if we want to do each one of these slides individually or come back to them, but um, we're requesting to return the frozen police officer and request the position. Oh, it's already there. Uh, that's about $180,000 a year um, in cost. Again, just a reminder, we're currently authorized to fill the police officer position that's sort of frozen, but um, we expect that to become vacant again in early July. So we'd like to fill that on a, on a regular basis and not have it become frozen again July 1st or following the retirement. Um, the receptionist position, I kind of mentioned that that position does support all the um, admin departments here in City Hall. And kind of, if we had one, kind of our biggest bang for our buck type of support there. Um, the development services technician in public works as well as the approximate 1,700 hours of recreation coordinator for lifeguard. That total cost is about 153,000. But again, um, just last year's lifeguard contract was 95,000. It's going up to 110, so that offsets the majority of that. There's also some restructuring that Nikki did with her um, seasonal staffing that she's able to do by having this junior guard coordinator, so it reduces some of the other hours and it actually I believe it nets out to on the lifeguard side that we actually save money by going to this model. Um, I want to say it's 14 or 15,000 but I think Nikki can speak to that. Um, we're proposing that the two total positions again it's one that's vacant and then those other four or five that are partially filled remain the way they are right now we kind of hold status quo there. We seem to be getting by okay. Um, that savings is about 149,000. And then um, again, at mid-year, we do it anyways, but just kind of throwing it up there that we can reevaluate staffing at mid-year. So if you would like, Mary, I can pause here and we can discuss the staffing before moving on to the uh, early childhood and youth program funds. Let me just check with Larry and see if there's any emails that have come through. Larry, do you see any email? Mayor Story, I do not have any email right now. Okay, why don't you go ahead then, Jim. All right. 
Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I was just curious, what is the development service technician in public works? What, what does that person do? And are they in the field or um, I'm just trying to get a better idea. I haven't heard of this yet. Certainly. I'm going to um, defer to our public works director, Steve, and have him kind of give you the background on that. Good evening once again, Mayor and Council. So the proposal here is we currently have a environmental projects coordinator in public works and working with Katie in community development department, we think it's important that we reappoint that position to be a more of an environmental and sustainability coordinator and that they take on such things as the climate action plan, uh, addressing sea level policy and what we need to do that for sea level rise. Um, we take over the um, solid waste and recycling from the systems of city manager and I continue doing the stormwater program. So we're kind of reconfiguring that position that will be um, probably about 50-50 between community development issues and public works issues. And then to fill in the plan checking and encroachment permit issuing and other technical issues that we have in public works that are currently done by that position, we would backfill that position with the new development services tech position. Okay, got it. So we're getting more of a focus now on uh, environmental and related, let's say, issues. And yeah, I think we, we generally feel that we need to have new staff to address those issues as we move forward. Um, it's a lot, there's a lot of issues on it, it's hard to keep up with it, and uh, by dedicating a position there, we think that would benefit the city the most. Okay, thank you very much. Go ahead, Jim. All righty. Um, so uh, the next key discussion point is the Early Childhood Youth and Program Fund. This year, we're estimating that the ECYP will get about $61,000 in COP revenue. In addition, we're, gonna, we're estimating that we're going to be starting the year with about a $68,000 fund balance. So that's um, $129,000 of ECYP funding that um, is available for those types of, of programs. Right now, the draft budget, I just placed the ongoing revenue into the community grant funding under the um, ECYP grants just as a placeholder so that we don't lose sight of it. Um, I have not done anything with the 68,000. So um, we're looking for some feedback on is the 61,000 the correct use of that revenue or would the council like to see something different? Um, do we want to do stuff with the six, $68,000? Um, we don't necessarily have to decide that tonight, but we can start developing some plans for that. Um, a couple of ideas we've kicked around is youth program scholarships, whether it's um, after school, junior guards, or camp. Um, we could consider a policy, and I just put a 50-50 split as an example. Um, on the other restricted COT for the local business groups, we split it 50-50 between the, the chamber and the BIA, so that was as deep a thought as I put into that split percentage. So um, that was just kind of to get the conversation started. And any, any other ideas that we don't have there? You know, maybe um, to start that conversation, I guess I wanted to ask Jim, is there a particular reason why we were trying to maintain a fund balance of $68,442? No, it was um, a combination of things. Um, the biggest one being we're getting much more TOT revenue than we um, anticipated when we adopted the budget, both last year, um, fiscal year 2021 as well as 21-22. So it's kind of built up. Um, and the other thing is we were getting some of the, I believe some of the community development block grant money went for, um, or if it wasn't this money, it might've been out of the outside of school time when it was going to one of the grant funding sources that we had was covering some of this and we could only use one funding source or the other. So that's kind of a perfect storm of things happening to, to get to that balance. But the goal is to not really carry a balance from year to year. It's to more get this money out into the community. Okay. Um, 
Council Member Brett. Thank you, Mayor Story. I have a question about the scholarships that were provided to students in the OST <laughs> program. I remember, Nikki, um, you, we had some challenges with giving out those scholarships because of the restricted dollars. Uh, they were restricted to students who are on, uh, they, were, they were specific. The county gave us money so that we could provide scholarships. Does that sound familiar, Nikki? Okay, so um, looking ahead, how have you thought or planned on how those scholarships would look in the coming year or where you would get that funding? Or were you gonna come back to us and ask for that money again? <laughs> Great. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, so to address Council Member Brooks's question there. So um, yeah, there was, for the OST program when we did that funding, there was restrictions. Um, we're no longer in those contracts anymore, so we don't have those restrictions any longer. Um, and moving forward, um, well, I guess, this year, I'll pause and say this year, um, we have received scholarships from a couple of different organizations that have been our traditional pre-pandemic partners um, for like our junior guard program, our camp program. Um, they're small funds, but they do provide scholarship for um, those particular programs, restricted program um, funds. And then for the after school program, the school district um, had, con had contributed <clears throat> a, about $16,000 um, in order to provide scholarships for that program. And so that's kind of the total pool of scholarship funds. And uh, moving forward, um, it would be beneficial to continue to have fellowship resources for our youth programming, um, but be able to expand that to include all of our youth programming. So right now, if you sign up for a class um, in recreation, there is no scholarship funding for that particular avenue. Um, it would, we would have to go to the independent contractors and ask them if they're willing to discount um, for that particular child. So having um, scholarship funds that would be available for any youth programming within recreation would be desirable. Okay, thank you, Nikki. Um, I guess my, to Jim, just to your point of consider the policy, the 50-50 split would be 50 to Parks and Rec, and then the 50 would maintain in the grant, in the community grants, is that what this is? Yeah. Yeah, I kind of left that okay. detail out. Okay, okay. Um, I guess I'll just share my thoughts on that. I, you know, ideally it would make sense for the entire fund um, source to go into Parks and Rec. It seems that that would allow for some better management of for budgeting and make things easier. Um, my concern is though, then that would leave a significant um, gap in the community grants funding and so I just don't know what that would look like today. Um, I know that Council Member Brown and I will be sitting down to talk about the community grants um, and based off of the outcomes that we received in the presentation from Optimal Solutions, it did highlight that um, youth were uh, a critical uh, body that needed some, some extra resources. So. Um, I, that's just my two cents on, I don't know that I could give any specific direction tonight until after we uh, can, I, I can't until I meet with Council Member Brown on that subcommittee. So, and, we, and we can um, bring this back at either the next budget hearing or any of the two after that, or or actually we could adopt the budget. This, this funding is restricted, so we're not doing anything other than ECYT stuff with it and just how we allocate it, we could decide later on. And, and I guess the, I, what I didn't ask Nikki is what the timeline for the need of scholarships or anything else, since we do have what Mayor Story said of that carryover balance. Um, and what I, I guess what I would wanna know is 
what what's the current need to 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 provide anything right now and and two um you know what the what our normal uh, ex, uh our normal giving for the community grants looks like so uh for for the children's portion of it so those are two pieces of the puzzle that would be helpful for me to to make any decisions Um, should I go ahead and address that that first question there? Um, yeah. Okay. So the uh, as far as need for this year um, with this budget, we'll we'll wrap up pretty quickly. The school year for after school um, is is mostly covered um, from what the school district has has provided. But looking forward, we have not had any conversations as to whether or not they will plan to contribute again. Um, and also looking forward, um, the activity that we are getting for our summer camp scholarships is, is operating within the gifts that have already been received, um, as well as within our, uh, the junior guards in particular has received a substantial fund, um, and, but for classes or anything else, um, for the rest of this budget, it would just be based on the actual request. Okay, thanks, Nikki. If next time you can all, um, let us know what other additional projects or programs that you think could benefit having the extra carryover to utilize. Um, otherwise, it would stay in the community grants and, and then Council Member Brown and I could and review that. But I'm just, I just want to make sure that we're fulfilling or supporting Parks and Recs as much as possible with the, with the carryover. So any, any projects or ideas, if you want to bring that next time, that'd be great. All right. I would be happy to do that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, on a related question, um, Jim, um, of that restricted money, uh, 70000 is earmarked for the local business group. Is, is there a particular plan uh, or process for um, allocating that funding? So uh, <clears throat> that funding, um, when it comes in, I want to say we do it on a quarterly basis. We take, um, we break out the restricted portion of all of the TOT and we move the um, children funding, that stays in the fund actually, the um, 50% of the local business group money is moved over into the BIA fund since we do their accounting for them, basically their bookkeeping. And then we issue a payment for the other 50% of the local business groups directly to the um, Capitola Soquel Chamber. So they get theirs, the businesses get theirs based on actual receipts on a quarterly basis. And and so that 70,000 is just allocated to the BIA and then to the chamber. Yes, 50-50. Okay. And, and then that was, um, I, I don't think that was in the ballot measure. I believe that was council direction at the time um, the measure was approved. I think if council desires, they could change that allocation. Mm -hmm. But I would need to, I, I would need to confirm that. I'm pretty sure. But, That's yeah. correct, Jim. Yeah. Did Can you repeat that? I'm sorry, it went my computer. What was that, Mayor, story that you said? Oh, I was just inquiring that the uh, that seventy thousand the local business group, you know, half of it goes to the BIA, and half of it goes to the chamber. Um, and I was just, do we get reports back from those business groups of how that funding is utilized? So we annually, we see the BIA's budget when the city council approves the BIA's project, which they don't really sort of pull out this funding versus the other, the BIA assessments, but they do, the council actually does have the opportunity to approve their overall budget and review it. The Chamber of Commerce, we've never done that before. You know, we've given them $30,000 ever since I came to the city. Um, and so they historically, they have not provided sort of a budget or you know proposed uses for the funding. So, and I guess also just to back up with what um, 
Director Malberg said, the council has the discretion to allocate the funding to local business groups. And so it could be 60-30, past direction from the council was 50-50, so that's what we've been going with. Um, but you certainly could come up with another formula if you wanted to. Well, I think, I mean, yeah, I know that previously we've always gave discretionary money to the chamber, um, but in my view, this is no longer discretionary money. It's, um, you know, based upon, um, you know, the, um, you know, the COT um, increase um, um, election. Um, and so, I mean, I just think that, you know, we could probably have better management and control um, and leave some documentation to see that you know, that, that money is being uh, used effectively. Uh, particularly, and you know, the chamber is a, is a, it's a Capitola Soquel chamber. Um, and I would like to assure that, you know, that our funding is being used for Capitola local businesses. Um, so, so maybe, you know, when you come back, we could have, I would like to see maybe a little bit more analysis about that. Um, and I'm also thinking about, you know, the businesses are going to incur expenses for the park that's coming up. Um, and I'm just wondering if, you know, if some of this uh, funding could be utilized for that, those purposes to help support you know, them in that endeavor. Um, okay, do any other council members have comments on this particular topic? Seeing none, carry on, Jim. Thank you, Mayor. Oh, hold on, oh. Council Member Bertrand. You <clears throat> sorry, Jim. Oh, don't worry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I'm glad you brought up that new idea about the uh, parkless support. Um, because, you know, in the last discussion, we were talking about just paying for protections from the automobiles and maybe some ballots and, you know, who would pay for that. And uh, you brought up some points in that regard too. So um, I think that's worth a discussion. And I think we all know that some of the businesses are going to be better able or not so able to, you know, make a parklet and, uh, you know, carry that expense. So um, this may be an opportunity to help level the field a little bit and keep our um, Esplanade area vital. So. Okay, go ahead, Jim. And then this is the last of my key discussion point uh, slides. So this is on the fund balance that Councilmember Brooks was asking about earlier. So we're uh, projecting an ending fund balance, and I'll call it a budgetary fund balance, kind of available fund balance of 1.3 million at the end of fiscal year 22-23. And that's after using um, the 3.56 million fund balance for city council goals. So general fund is really healthy right now. Some potential uses, um, and I have these a little bit out of order. I'm going to read them a little bit out of order. Our historic fund balance target has been about 500,000. So, in a normal year, we would sit here and say we have about $800,000 of funding that um, available for additional items. Um, some of those things, the wharf project funding to do the full project is short about 800,000. Um, even though we have 150,000 towards the um, community center repairs, there's the potential that that number could get much larger as we start getting into that building. Um, potentially 550 to $600,000 on top of the 150. <clears throat> and then we also have um, the resiliency account that's at 385,000. Staff's recommending right now that um, we hold on to both the resiliency account as well as the 1.3 million fund balance for the time being a um, couple of reasons. The recovery from the pandemic is ongoing. That's making Jamie and I much less nervous now than it did previously, but it is still ongoing and we may see some, some shifts as people return to different activities. Um, we have a request in with Congressman Panetta to be included in his annual um, grant request. And we should learn the outcome. I think we find out the next week or two if we're included in the request. And then if they um, normally notify you if you've been awarded a grant, 
in late August or in September if they do their budget on time, right? They, their fiscal year is October through September. And then um, we are in ongoing discussions with the school district about the community center. So that's where um, some of those some of those additional community center repairs could um, potentially come into play with those ongoing discussions. Um, <clears throat> I have one other slide I'm going to jump to, and then we can come back to this one. So we do have um, a couple of draft uh, minor adjustments, budget adjustments that we've listed up here. I've got notes from all of the stuff that we talked about tonight, but some of the things that uh, we're looking at is um, on the park list, the draft budget right now has no revenue, parking revenue in any of the 27 spaces that are being occupied. Um, at the time I put it together, I wasn't quite sure how that program was gonna continue. Now that we know how that's gonna move forward after June 1st, and I believe the restaurants need to notify planning by mid-May or so. So hopefully by the next um, budget hearing, we'll have a pretty good idea of which spots are, if any, are returning to parking and which ones will be parklets and then kind of um, fine tune our, our parking revenue around that. Um, on the other side, on the expenditure side, there's some additional PD staffing that we'd like to talk about at the next budget hearing. I don't have all the specific details tonight to get into it, but um, I'll be circling back around with the chief to get, get all that pulled together. The uh, city council member training that council member Brooks mentioned that um, I think we have it in at 3,000 right now. It should have been 10, so we'll make that correction. And then the homeless shelter costs. We have um, just under 40,000 in the community grant program that I put in there for the um, our homeless action partnership contribution. I found out that uh, about 31 to 32,000 of that can come out of the housing fund. So that'll actually be a reduction on the expenditure side probably will offset a few items of, well, between the parking revenue and the reduction in the half fund funding or shifting of the half funding, that'll probably offset those other 10. What's on the page is probably a net zero. <clears throat> so I did want to throw those in there, but we can uh, jump back to the fund balance discussion if you like. This is the last of the um, kind of key discussion point slides that I have. Yes, um, well, we, we have some questions here, so um, Council Member Brown. Thank you. Um, the staff recommendation of reevaluating in the summer or the fall, I think that's probably a, a pretty good idea for now. I know we've got a couple more uh, budget meetings to go, so we may identify some things along the way that we want to um, work with this fund balance on. Um, but otherwise, I'd say if we get through all of these uh, budget meetings and we still have a fund bed ballot, excuse me, fund balance, then reevaluating um, at that time is probably the best way to go. Uh, I do have a question and I apologize if it was already explained and I missed it or if it's going to be at a future meeting um, or maybe we, we did this at a uh, mid-year and, and I just forgot, but um, typically we usually have a discussion about our capital improvement projects and like which specific streets we want to do work on and what other, you know, kind of public works projects are important to us and where we want to put the money into those. Will that be a part of this budget process or is that going to be a separate um, discussion at another time? So we um, typically do the CIP during the second budget hearing. We kind of, um, we, we have this conversation about fund balance to give Steve a better idea of what kind of funding he's going to see. He's got a pretty big list right now, um, so it's pretty close to being pulled together, but we will definitely be bringing back with the full CIP at the next budget hearing on the 19th. Oh, perfect. Okay. I don't know if you can tell. I'm chomping at the bit to start uh, naming some streets that need some work. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, so I think the only thing I would ask for, and, and, and this would be obviously at the discretion of, of the council, now that I know a little bit more about the parks and the updating of it and moving the funding to Jade Street, I and because it's larger, I and knowing that just to fill, there's like the squishy stuff of the costs related to that, um, I'm, I'm 
requesting that we increase the 150 to 300 since it's a larger space and because we do have um, a fund balance for the park structure or the area around it. Um, and I'm just wondering if we can do that for, for next time as well. And I don't know if I can do that or not, so. <laughs> well, I, I I guess I would ask um, maybe if staff could come back um, with some sort of preliminary assessment uh, of what the project would entail and, and then what the cost would be um, on it. I guess I, I feel a little uncomfortable just blindly drawing another yeah. 50000 at and and basically committing that or that particular project when, you know, um, without some sense of yeah that that's what is is necessary and this is what we get from it um, so maybe just again more information back to us um, going to that particular question so Jim I'll just be a little bit more specific um, it's the the cost I'm referring to for the request is for the fill of the spongy I don't know the name of it spongy stuff <laughs> um, by, yeah by doing mm -hmm. that really takes away from all the other issues of, of the universal design and, and things like that. And I believe that, so that's the cost that request I would be making. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we can definitely have that conversation um, in more detail, especially when we're talking CIP. Yeah, and, and maybe some more background about um, universal design. I, I know I've heard Council Member Brooks mention that a couple of times. That, and I, I'd have to say I'm not really familiar with what that is, so maybe some education, at least for me and maybe for the other council members about that. Can I do the presentation? Please. Well, I'm, kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> well, I was going to say it, it sounds like you know a great deal about it, and so I'm, I'm, I'm eager to learn about what that is. Um, council Member Bird Strand. Yeah, just a. Uh, I think that probably escaped you, but I've been reading some emails about this, and maybe Yvette got got them also. And um, so, at least two emails on different kinds of park design, um, universal design, was the terms that I remember. So it's probably somewhere buried in our emails. Okay, are we? It looks like we're ready to go on. With your presentation, Jim. Okay, so actually, this is the last slide I have. Um, so, what we're looking for is that I have recommendations. That's kind of labeled there. But what we're looking for is um, any of the questions, any budget questions that we have. So, I've, I've got a good page here of stuff to follow up on. Um, any areas for additional details on either anything we talked about tonight or anything we haven't discussed yet? If there's anything else we want to bring back at either the next. May 19th or one of the, the other ones, we can do that. Um, the preliminary feedback on, on the, the staffing, the ECY, NYP, um, and general fund, we kind of just did that, so I think we're good there. So it's really just any additional questions or um, requests for additional information outside of what we've already talked about tonight. Council members have anything? Um, yeah, Council Member Bertrand. Um, we talked about this when the library was being planned and now that it's built, um, are we planning any programs with the library? I, I think Nikki had, had sort of contemplated doing that uh, for after school kids or the, the youth. And I'm just wondering if, if that's progressed. If that hasn't progressed, then, you know, start getting that discussion going, I think that would be important because there's a lot of kids that go there after school and also other times. So I don't know if Nikki wants to jump in or if this is something that's sort of on the back burner at this point. Well, or maybe that could be an item we ask staff to come bring back to us. Um, Thank you, Mayor. I think that's a great idea. Discussion and as I know we talked about it a lot when you know the library was in planning and then construction we we're always we were looking forward to having youth activities there 
I know I. Okay. Um, any other council members have um, some, maybe some final questions? I, I assume, Jim, if, if we were to maybe have some questions, we can email them to you um, to include um, in our next session, budget session. Absolutely. Um, and not yet, I, I don't see any other council members' hands, but there, there was um, maybe one um, um, overall question that I had about, um, you know, your, on your presentation about using Measure F funds um, to kind of balance our budget um, into the future. Um, and I guess um, I wanted to ask and just kind of make sure, because, you know, the Measure F funds were, um, you know, approved for specific projects. Um, and I know it, it included public safety as well. Um, but when we are um, allocating those funds, are, are we accounting and tracking them so that we can assure the public that they're being used for the intended purposes? Yeah, I actually, um, I haven't updated it in the last 12 months or so, but I do have a spreadsheet that has tracked from year to year measure of revenues coming in and what they've been expended on. Um, I, when the pandemic hit, Kind of, I kind of stopped doing that, so I can I can definitely revive that spreadsheet and get it caught up. And well, I think it. I mean, and move going into the future when you know we're kind of we're using those funds to um, you know balance the budget. I just think it's important that we be able to be accountable to the public and point to them and show them, yeah, these funds, this amount went to public safety, or we're, we're putting more into the war. I know the other two projects are done, um, but um, yeah, I, I think that that would be important for us to do um, in uh, retaining you know, the, the public confidence. So, um, anything else? Any council members have last words? Um, any staff have last, last words? I don't think so. I just want to thank council for all the feedback. Uh, there was a lot of really good questions and we have some good material to go over at our next budget hearing. So appreciate all the feedback and questions and we're going to come back in two weeks. Well, we'll see you in one week at a regular meeting, but in two weeks to go back into the budget and hopefully be able to dig into some of these topics more deeply. All right. And yeah, thank you. And council member Tran. I, I think um, staff did a great presentation and thank you, Jim and all the other members who answered particular or pointed questions. Uh, appreciate that. It made it much easier for me to um, ask questions because the topics were well presented. So I appreciate that. Okay. Um, I do appreciate that. I, I do want to um, thank the department heads and staff also. Um, this year, everybody seemed to get everything to move really quickly and uh, made this process much easier. So I do appreciate it. It's much smoother this year than it's been the last few years. All right, kudos to all the staff and the department heads. Um, before I do uh, um, close this out here, I, I, I did want to check with Larry, make sure that there are no um, uh, emails from the public. I see that there are no attendees. Mayor Story, we do not have any emails on this. Okay. Um, hearing that, thank you everyone. Um, I will now take us to um, uh, adjournment um, and I will adjourn this meeting until our next regularly scheduled meeting of the Capitola City Council on May 12th, 2022 at 7 p.m. and to then our next uh, special budget session which will take place on May the 19th, 2022. Um, thank you everyone. Um, and as I always close, be kind to yourself and be kind to others. Um, everybody have a good night uh, and until next time, bye-bye.